my, I don't know what happened to my program. The devil is surely trying to cause me not to be able to publish this video. In my opinion, this video is one of the most important ones I'll ever make. Um, only because I'm trying to um, show by science and logic and reason how evolution, how there is no scientific proof for evolution. Um, however, how science and history um, does point to God or Creator. Okay, so first let me start with the definition for what a hypothesis theory and law, scientific law, are. Okay, by using chemistry.about.com. All right, a hypothesis is an educated guess based on observation. Usually a hypothesis can be supported or refuted through experimentation or more observation. A hypothesis can be disproven but not proven to be true. Okay, so um, we can prove something isn't true by conducting an experiment and asking our questions. However, we can't really necessarily prove that it's true. Um, so examples, if no one, if you see no difference in cleaning ability of various laundry detergents, you might hypothesize that cleaning effecti effectiveness is not affected by which detergent you use. You can see this hypothesis can be disproven if a stain is removed by one detergent or, and not another. On the other hand, you cannot prove the hypothesis. Even if you never see a difference in the cleanliness of your clothes after trying a thousand detergents, there might be one you haven't tried that could be different. So a hypothesis is an educated guess based on observation, and it's to be tested. Okay, a theory, a scientific theory, summarizes a hypothesis or group of hypotheses that have been supported with repeated testing. A theory is valid as long as there is no evidence to dispute it. Now keep this in mind as we look at evolution, because science, the science world claims that evolution is a theory, the theory of evolution, just like the theory of gravity, law of gravity now, it's a law, okay, um, the principle, the cell principle theory, okay, and so forth. So they say that evolution is a theory, although, ask yourself this question, has it been supported by repeated testing? Okay, has it been observed over periods of time? And is it valid as long as there are no evidence to dispute it? So they say that it's true, it's valid. A theory is valid as long as there's no evidence to dispute it. But we're going to look at some evidence that disputes the theory of evolution. Okay, and then a law. A law is generalizes a body of observations. At the time it is made, no exceptions have been found to a law. Scientific laws explain things, but they do not describe them. One way to tell a law and a theory apart is to ask if the description gives you a, mean, gives you a means to explain why something is working. So consider Newton's law of gravity. Newton could use this law to predict the behavior of a dropped object, but he couldn't explain why it happened. He could just use the law of gravity to predict that it's going to happen. Okay, so but a scientific law, if you if you if you're asked to define hypothesis, theory, and law, keep in mind the definitions of proof and these words can vary slightly depending on the scientific discipline. Okay, so basically a theory, a hypothesis is an educated guess based on observation, although they haven't been able to observe evolution, macroevolution, okay, which is changing of a species from one to another. A theory is a hypothesis that's been supported by repeated testing and there's no evidence to dispute it, that it's valid. And then a law is, um, explains how things work, okay. And once, usually, if you look up the uh, definition of a scientific law, it is a theory that's been proven to be um, valid, that a, a way of how it, a law is 
proven to be accurate in scientific community, okay? So let's look at some of the things that they say in regards to um, evolution. Okay, spontaneous generation. Spontaneous generation, the hypoth hy hypothetical process, so it's a hypothesis, the hypothetical process by which living organisms develop from non-living matter. Also, the archaic theory that utilized this process to explain the, ori the origin of life. According to this theory, so pieces of cheese and bread wrapped in rags and left in a dark corner, for example, were thus thought to produce mice because after several weeks or mold, there were mice in the rags. Many believe in spontaneous generation because it explains such occurrences as the appearance of maggots on decaying meat. But we know after observation and testing that spontaneous generation is not um, valid. The maggots got there from flies laying eggs on the meat and the mice got there from being attracted to the cheese. By the 18th century, it had become obvious that higher organisms could not be produced by non-living material. The origin of microorganisms such as bacteria, however, was not fully determined until Louis Pasteur proved in the 19th century that microorganisms reproduce. He discovered, along with um, Robert Cook, <clears throat> They discovered bacteria and single cell organisms with the use of the microscope. And um, those things were always around and they're still the same today. Um, they don't evolve, my, uh, bacteria don't evolve to multicellular organisms. And we still have fungi, bacteria, amoebas, and protozoa that are single cell organisms that aren't evolving into multicellular organisms and we see no macro evolution um, uh, transition of like a fish becoming an amphibian a fish has always been a fish and amphibians have always been amphibians and humans have always been human we don't see a um, variation, a macro change, a big change from one species to another evolving. Um, there, there are no intermediate species fossils. We never have seen a fish with legs or a fish with a three-chambered heart instead of a two-chambered heart or with um, appendages instead of fins or lungs instead of gills. If one of those things were to change on a fish so that it could evolve into an amphibian and live on the land. Um, just one alteration, macro change, not micro, but a big change in its structure, such as its heart changing into a three-chambered heart or developing lungs instead of gills or feet instead of fins would would be detrimental to that species. It wouldn't be able to survive in its current conditions long enough to have years and years go by um, and reproducing that way until it was fit to live on land. And again, there's been no fossil records proving that. But spontaneous generation is the, the basis of evolution. Um, you know, a, a puddle of ooze and then life forming from it, okay? Um, that is living things, even a single cell living organism developing from non-living matter. Life coming from non-life, okay? But here, even on Britannica.com, okay, it shows that it, it's not a viable or proven or true hypothesis and again there's no sorry I have that thing popping up there are no fossil records to reflect um, macro evolution a uh, change in species all right now let's look at also spontaneous generation I had somewhere 
um, goes against the cell principle. Now I don't know where that is. Hold on. Okay, here on TudorVista.com, we see the cell theory and cell principle. And basically, sorry, let me close that ad. Basically, the cell principle states there's three main statements to the cell principle. One, all living things are made up of cells. We know that's true. Plants, animals, humans were made up of cells. Second, the smallest living unit of living things is the cell. Okay? And third, all cells come from pre existing cells. So, life exists only in cells. Um, living organisms can be composed of a single cell, like an amoeba, paramecium, um, so forth, or composed of cells or multicellular masses, okay, like bacteria or. Um, and it's the smallest living unit, okay, and cells always arise from pre existing cells by a process of cell division. We, I came from two reproductive cells, one uh, a reproductive cell from my father with 23 chromosomes and a reproductive cell from my mother with 23 chromosomes. I, my, I started as one cell with 46 chromosomes, 23 from each parent. I was one cell big and I grew into a baby in utero by a process of call, called cellular differentiation where one cell became many different types of cells, liver, heart, lungs, kidneys, hair, skin, okay, eyes. That is cellular differentiation and scientists today cannot even explain how that happens because it's a process of life. God created us in the womb, it says in Jeremiah. And um, cells always come from pre-existing cells. Okay, so that disproves spontaneous generation, life, a living thing coming from non-living matter. There has to be the cells there before to create the new cells. All right, also, Man, the pop-ups. The second law of entropy. The second law of thermodynamics, which is a law of science, it states that in any cyclic process, the entropy will either increase or remain the same. So entropy is disorder, okay? A measure of the disorder of a system. A measure of the multiplic multiplicity of a system. A measure of the amount of energy, which is unavailable to do work. So a measure of the disorder of a system. Since entropy gives information about the evolution of an isolated system with time, it is said to give us the direction of time's arrows. Okay, basically, higher entropy state is disordered. For an isolated system, the natural course of events takes the system to a more disordered, higher entropy state. So, according to the second law of thermodynamics, if the Big Bang happened and it was disorder, it was an explosion, and then order came from the disorder, that would be opposite what the second law of entropy states because we know after observation of all the hundreds of years of science that we've conducted, um, observable and recorded science, that the law of entropy, we see that disorder comes from order. Um, things become more disordered with time. Um, there's a higher state of disorder. So that goes against evolution. Species becoming better and more ordered and more perfect from disordered and as well as the environment um, from the Big Bang. An explosion, disorder, becoming more ordered. Okay? And having an atmosphere to breathe, right distance from the sun for heat, and um, the exact right distance away from the sun, the sun to have living things on this planet. We have the right amount of uh, oxygen in our environment for humans and animals. 21% of our atmosphere is oxygen, whereas 79% is... Um, I'm sorry, 
8% is nitrogen, 21% is oxygen, and 1% is other gases. So our atmosphere that we breathe is 21% oxygen, 78% nitrogen, and 1% other gases. It's just the right amount of oxygen for humans and animals to breathe. And we breathe out carbon dioxide, and so do the animals. And the plants breathe in carbon dioxide, and they give off oxygen, which gives the plants, I mean the animals and humans, the oxygen to breathe. So it's a symbiotic relationship between plants and then animals and humans back and forth. And all of this order and structure came from disorder. I don't think so. It goes against the laws of science and the mathematical probability of that happening by chance. Um, spontaneous generation, which has already been proven to be false, and order coming from disorder, and all the instances of perfection coming from imperfection, the probability of all that happening is astronomical and improbable. Um, all of those things point to a direct point in time that the, that the Earth was formed and it was created perfect at that moment in time. Yes, I believe in the Big Bang Theory, but it was right here in Genesis 1. In Genesis 1, the Word of God says, Sorry, it's loading. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This is the Big Bang. Yes, there was a beginning of time and space, um, but there was an outside source that created the heavens, the universe, and the earth, and then formed everything that was on it, and it's written in Genesis 1 and 2. Okay, now, how am I going by science? I'm, by looking at God's word. Okay, first of all, I'm going to leave this link to um, an article that this man wrote, Logical Proof of the Existence of a Divine Creator, Why Atheism is Not Logically Sound. So if you would read through this if you're interested. Okay, um, showing how the Bible and science point to a creator. But then there's also... Um, I'm sorry, logical arguments, syllogisms that point to an existence of God. So a syllogism is a three statement. There's three um, premises that use three terms in a logical order, and the order that they're written in either proves that the argument is valid or invalid. And so um, this one the one for um, everything having a cause, it states everything that begins to exist has a cause. So everything that begins to exist has a cause. That means something caused it. We see that that is true. Okay, Everything, your clock, your computer, you, um, any animal or plant before when it began to exist there was a cause that caused it to come into an existence. Premise two, the universe began to exist. We know that's true. Obviously, even with the Big Bang, not looking at Genesis 1, but even if you look at the Big Bang theory, we know that there was a beginning to the universe. The universe began to exist. So everything that begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist. Therefore, the universe has a cause. So this, this argument, this logical argument, proves that there was a cause, um, something that caused the universe to come into existence. Okay, that is one argument for a creator causing it. So I'll leave a link because there's 12 arguments here that are all valid, proving to the existence of a creator. Okay, now let's look at history. Is there any evidence for Jesus outside of the Bible? Without using the Word of God, let's look at historical documents and history. 
Okay, so the only eyewitness accounts are not just in the Word of God. How do we know that Hitler or Napoleon or John F. Kennedy or Nero or any of these people existed? Because they're written down by eyewitness accounts in historical documents, letters, and personal testimonies. Okay? So, um, there are historical records of Jesus Christ, okay, outside of the Bible itself, although the Bible is full of historical accounts and um, eyewitness accounts of Jesus. Okay, so non-biblical pagan accounts um, of Jesus Christ is Thallus, 52 AD, okay? Um, Tacitus, 56 to 120 AD. Mara Bar Seropian, 70 AD. Flagon, Pliny the Younger, I can't say his name, Suetonius, Luc Lucian of Somosata, Samosata, Celsus, okay, hostile non biblical Jewish, Jewish accounts of Jesus, Josephi Josephus, Jewish Talmud, the Talad Yeshu, okay, so there's many historical accounts besides um, the Bible pointing to the historical person of Jesus, okay? Then you have to ask yourself, well, okay, even if Jesus was a living person and we know it's true, how do we know he's God? Well, because he said he was, and he fulfilled, his coming fulfilled hundreds of Bible prophecies regarding himself that were written hundreds and even thousands of years before he came. And he, his birth and the timing of it and um, who he was, was all prophesied and written by different men years hundreds of years, even thousands of years before he came to live on this earth and he fulfilled every one of them. So nothing has no um, uh, fortune teller or such has been that accurate as the prophets of the Bible. Okay, uh, their accuracy is 100%. Okay, so biblical data um, are historically testable. So we also, we can look at the Bible and the writings in it and compare them to, um, compare them to real life um, history. The Hittites and the Phoenicians and the Romans and the Greeks and um everything that they, you know, their money systems and their political leaders and their religious leaders and all of that. And it's all historically accurate. The Bible, um, the historical data in the Bible and the, ar ar the archaeology, um, the figures even in the Old Testament, Sargon, the king, okay, the Hittites, all of this Archaeology and history text back up what the Bible states. So um, it's, it's consistent with what we know in archaeology and history. Also, how do you know the Bible's true? Starting with the foundation. Okay, first of all, Christianity, Christianity is not a blind faith because we're basing our belief on, like I said, the laws of science and reason and logic, okay, and um, historical references and documentations, archaeology backing up that the Bible is accurate, what it states historically, archaeology-wise, and science-wise. Even in 1492, when when Columbus sailed the ocean blue and he thought the earth was flat, 
Okay, when people thought that the earth was flat, if they, they didn't read the Bible for themselves, especially the Catholics, um, they were only read too. But um, if they were to read the Bible, the Bible recorded in Job, which is one of the oldest books in the Bible, if not the first one, that the earth is round, the sphere of the earth. Sorry. Okay. Um, uh, hold on just a sec. So here in Isaiah 40, 22, um, the, the, word, the Bible says that God sits above the circle of the earth. The people below seem like grasshoppers to him. Spread, he spreads out the heavens like a curtain and makes his tent from them. Or a different translation, King James, it is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers that stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain and spreadeth them out as tent, a tent to dwell in. So the Bible recorded in Isaiah, okay, one of the Old Testament prophets that was alive. Let me see, I'll check. Okay, it says the prophet Isaiah lived around the six, um, 8th century BC. Right here it says um, 740 to 681 BC, King Ahaz of Judah was king at that time so not 1492 but 740 bc okay about what 2000 1900 years before that before christopher christopher columbus the prophet isaiah wrote that the, the circle of the earth hangs on nothing okay the circle of the earth all right so the Bible also backs up science that we have discovered in the last couple century or the last couple millennia. All right, so proof of science, proof of prophecy, okay, like I told you, there are 2,500 prophecies in the Bible. And now you have to remember that this wasn't written by one person. The Bible was written by 40 different men, 40, over a period of 2,000 years in different parts of the earth, of the world. And by there's 66 books, okay, 66 books written by 40 different men over a period of 2,000 years, and it all meshes, it all is cohesive, it all talks about the same thing through the Spirit of God, these men wrote the same thing. And they all, all the prophecies, there's 2,500, 2,000 have already come to be fulfilled. There's 500, 500 left. Um, most of those are in the book of Revelation about the end times. So of those 2,000 that have already come to pass, every single one of them came to pass just as they were written in the last 2,000 years. Okay? The Old Testament was written about 1450 B.C. And, and to 430 B.C., okay, and mostly by the prophets, the Old Testament prophets. And then um, we have the New Testament beginning um, with Matthew and Mark, eyewitnesses that lived with Jesus, to Paul and Luke and others um, that knew from other sources, they were like the second generation after Jesus, or the first generation after Jesus, okay? So, um, the proof of textual evidence, so like I said, those, all those, the, the Old and New Testament books together compose the Bible, and um, it all meshes together perfectly. It all says, this, they all state the same thing. Okay, so that is, the, the evidence for that, that being true is astronomical as well. Also, the proof of historians about the things that are written in the Bible, they all, they are all um, proven historically with cultures and civilizations. So, together, we looked at history, um, references for Jesus, 
Either he was who he claimed he, he said he was, which was God in the flesh, God come down to give salvation to men, um, or he was a lunatic. And if he was a lunatic, how did this book, written over 2,000 years time by 40 different men, all point to him as the Messiah and, and God with us, um, Emmanuel, which means God with us. Um, he fulfilled his time. He didn't plan his birth. He had no control over when he would be born, yet he came at that perfect time for prophecy, prophecy to be fulfilled. And um, many knew that. Okay, logical proofs, logically, with logic and reason, there is proof for a creator, for a god, and disproofs for evolution. Either, why do I point to evolution? Because evolution, there's either evolution, all life formed here as a matter of circumstance and chance, random chance and occurrences, or there was someone who caused it. We saw the logical argument for causation and how science, the cell principle and the law of entropy um, and macro evolution um, disprove evolution, but rather prove um, a creator or organization. Okay, and then we also looked at the Bible's accuracy and I'll leave links for that so that you can read it and its validity. And um, now my personal testimony, um, I know that the Lord, that there is a God, and I know that he loves his creation. Um, he cares for humans more than he cares for the animals. He gave humans um, authority over the animals and the plants. And um, he created us to be have a relationship with him. When he created the first um, man and woman, he actually lived amongst them. He walked with them in the garden, if you read Genesis 1 and 2. And he, he desired to have a relationship with us, um, but it was, it was us that chose to try to be like him when the enemy tempted us, okay? And um, it destroyed that close relationship, but he's always, always um, tried to redeem that through calling Abraham and um, giving his truth to man and Moses and even all the miraculous things he did for his people and then the things that he does for us once we accept him. Um, I have video testimonies, and I'll leave the links there because I don't want it, this to be too long. But um, I've, I've answered that question. How do I know that God is real? I know that God is real because he answers prayers, and I've seen him answer them miraculously. Um, that's a video that I entitled, uh, The Miracles That I've Seen. And... Um, You'll have to listen to it because it's really awesome, but I've seen him stop bleeding, and then the doctors couldn't even tell where the blood came from in my son's throat. I've seen him answer prayer when one of my sons was stabbed, and um, I prayed at that moment when he was being airlifted to a different city, and then I had to drive down there that it wouldn't have damaged any organs and he wouldn't need a blood transfusion, although I'm not against that, but I just prayed that he wouldn't need it. And the Lord answered both of those. Um, the knife went in about maybe at the most a half inch away, a third of an inch away from his kidney, above his kidney. So it didn't puncture his kidney. Um, he didn't require surgery, just um, closing of the wound. And um, his, he lost a lot of blood, um, but not enough to need a transfusion. So the Lord answered that prayer. And then... June 2014, I mean 2013, not this past summer, but the summer before, um, I would be dead right now if the Lord didn't heal me because in June 2013, um, I was really sick for a month and then my stomach kept hurting more and more and more. And um, I had intestinal issues and such. And then um, they did a CAT scan when I went to the hospital and I had a 
a suspicious mass in my the head of my pancreas and um, it was a mass and they, they measured it and then they did a second CAT scan right then and I prayed against the radiation from that and they used iodine to, for contrast and it was the same mass it was still there same measurements and all so they confirmed it with the second CAT scan and um, basically the doctor was talking to me like at least you caught it early and they they can do something about it you know meaning that it was cancerous and um, the Lord the Holy Spirit spoke to my husband and told in his mind and he just had the thought that I was gonna you, you know she, she's gonna be fine that she that he, the Lord basically told him I'm gonna take care of it and then on the later that day it's a long story but they thought I had an appendicitis too they told me to go home the surgeon didn't want to come in and then they said to get retested my blood tested uh, a few hours later before noon and then if it goes up I would have to go back to the hospital to get an appendectomy well I went back at 11 in the morning and my blood count my white count did go up so they sent me to the hospital but they sent me to a different one they said they didn't want to do anything at the other one to so go to the other hospital so I did and I was looking at getting an, my appendix removed and then trying to figure out what's wrong with my um, pancreas anyways when I was there they were more concerned about my pancreas and um, she said I'm going to try to get an MRI approved now this was like 12 14 hours later because it was early in the morning that I had had the CAT scan so by the time I got to the hospital it was like 4 in the afternoon the next, you know it was about 12 hours later and they did the MRI and on before I got to the hospital the Lord the Holy Spirit I had a thought in my mind I'm going to take care of it and I'm like okay so I just prayed and I and everyone was there's was people praying and um, when I was going to that MRI machine um, I'm sorry those are ads I figured out hold on that was just the devil I don't I can't find out where the ad is from so sorry <laughs> Anyways, on the way to the MRI, MRI machine from one building to the other, I have never felt that peace or that calm, that calmness or that joy or love that I had when I was going to the MRI building and um, I have the thought I've taken care of it. And I don't need to tell you that there was no mass in my pancreas with the MRI results. There was nothing there. So I know that the Lord heard our prayers and he answered it and I know he healed me I've seen him so I'll leave a link to my video about miracles that he's done there's many more but um, I know that he exists and besides all the historical logical and scientific data to back it up right here in John the book of John 15 um, starting in verse 13 okay the Lord says greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends and that's what Jesus did he came to this earth he was God fully God and he came to this earth he humbled himself and enabled himself to come and be born as a man so that he could sympathize with our weaknesses and live a perfect life that we could never live so that he could share who he was and his truth and the way to know him um, by having that fellowship with us and, sh and showing us who he is and he knew that he was going to be sent to the cross and die a, a painful horrible death by coming down here but he still chose to do it because greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends and he says you are my friends if you do whatever I command you no longer will I call you servants for a servant does not know what his master is doing but I have called you friends for all things that I heard from my father I have made known to you you did not choose me but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain that whatever you ask in the in the fa ask the Father in my name he may give you the things I command you that you love one another so and he did he healed me and he's my, he's my friend okay God's simple plan of salvation if you don't know Jesus um, I'm gonna leave a link to this 
basically you have to recognize that we are a sinner and that you we have all sinned and fallen short of God's glory we must be born again spiritually we need to ex because if we don't the wages of sin is death and separation from the Lord but if we believe in Jesus and who he said he was we will have eternal life okay so we need to accept and believe that Jesus is real that he died on the cross because he came down to share the news of salvation with us and that by his sacrifice um, we are able to be made righteous by believing on him and asking him to forgive us of our sins and to make us new creations whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved Romans 10 13 okay it does doesn't matter what we can gain here what's eternal matters okay so pray ask the Lord to reveal himself to you um, study these things that I've shown you and search for truth because God is truth and in him is no lie and the more you study and search for for truth you'll find that the Creator is real and then read the Word of God and believe in him if you confess before me me before men I will confess also you before my father which is in heaven so if we deny him before men he will deny us before his father so it's up to us it's a free will we all have free will to choose to serve to believe him or not and um, what we do here um, makes a difference for our eternal soul our eternal spirit God bless you I pray that the Lord be with you. In Jesus' name, amen.